Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Was salatu was salamu ala Rasulillah. Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. May the peace and blessings of God be upon you all. And welcome to the third and final lecture of the Sierra Forums series, The First Pillar, in which we have been discussing the proofs of God's existence. For those of you joining us for the first time today, my name is Radia. I am the president of Basira Forum and will be the MC today. Uh, before we proceed, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands from which we are all joining today, and I pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. This lecture is being recorded and will be made available to you all, inshallah, as will the recordings of the previous two weeks. Speaking of, um, let me very briefly summarize what we discussed in the first two lectures, mostly because it serves as a precede to what will come today. So we began with a very interesting talk from Ustad Abdullah Al Andalusi, who discussed theories regarding the creation of the universe and proved that only a transcendent power has the capacity to create something as intricate and complex as the universe. We brought this discussion back down to earth with Brother Ammar Haq in week two, who discussed the natural perfection and precision of our everyday surroundings. And we spoke of the importance of reflecting on how majestic even the smallest of creation is. This week brings all of that discussion together to discuss the innate necessity, why we as humans need to believe in a higher power. We will explore the moral, social, and psychological need for humankind to believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And to lead us through this discussion, it is an immense honor for me to introduce Ustad Talha Bozkurt, who has studied the Islamic sciences extensively across Turkey, Jordan, and the UK. He has recently completed postgraduate studies in modern Islamic thought at the University of Oxford and holds qualifications in theology, philosophy, mysticism, and religious studies. So if that alone doesn't intrigue you for today's lecture, I don't know what will. <laughs> so with that being said, Ustad Talha, I will hand it over to you. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقدة من لساني يفقهوا قولي ولا حول ولا قوة الا بالله العلي العظيم Brothers and sisters assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh I want to first and foremost thank the uh, Basira Forum organizers for this um, Sister Radi and her, her team and may Allah reward you all not only for this particular program uh, but also the wider uh, initiative of uh, establishing an organization to tackle I guess issues that are pertinent to uh, the Muslim community. Um, it's 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 quite an ambitious uh, endeavor, but I believe that with sincerity and uh, effort that Allah will uh, support you all in this journey. And alhamdulillah, this has been a good start so far with, with I guess this particular series, having good speakers that have preceded me. Um, at the same time, uh, as Sister Radia mentioned, I've sort of been probably given the most challenging of those tasks to, to deliver, um, and that is titled The Human Need to Believe in Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Uh, so there are some uh, disclaimers um, that I would like to share before I do proceed. Uh, the first one is the idea of <clears throat> navigating the innate, which is a topic or a term concept that will appear throughout. Uh, my presentation. Um, now, obviously, uh, because we're not uh, dealing with the empirical realm you, through sense perception, uh, it's always a challenge to theorize and articulate uh, the concept of the innate or what we will see as uh, the fitra or, or what other uh, disciplines can you know, call intuition um, or that innate in, in, in inward feeling internal uh, disposition and so forth um, and I think uh, one of the challenges of speaking about the innate or, or one of the things that one has to be cautioned in is that we don't ascribe uh, unconditional or definitive epistemic value to the idea of the inward purely based on human subjectivities and by that I mean 
that when we speak about something that we experience internal, it should not logically flow that therefore it, this is true. Otherwise, that just opens uh, the door to an infinite uh, infinite possibilities of inward uh, human subjectivities, um, and they can't all be uh, right, obviously. So we'll be touching upon that, and I think this topic is ever so pertinent today, particularly with developments that are having in um, some you know some uh, disciplines such as uh, uh, gender identity theory for example uh, one of the main arguments for um, uh, I guess the trans activist movements or, or, or the, 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 the justification um, is the idea that this is an inward feeling that uh, individuals have now obviously without uh, delving to the contentious topic all I'm trying to do is to, to warn us that even when we navigate from an Islamic perspective, uh, it's important to remind ourselves that it only follows through that this can be true because of the preceding epistemic resources. And obviously that is the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu uh, Alaihi The second is one of the topics uh, uh, that was posed was the idea of the human need for God from a psychological perspective. This is uh, an immense topic in and of itself, and that one that probably requires a, a distinct lecture and one that I can't deliver because it's not my specialty. Uh, but it's important that when we do speak about psychology or the study of the human psyche, that we don't limit it to um, a Western paradigm. So it's important that, as I mentioned here, that we do establish an indig indigenous Islamic theory, theoretical orientation uh, to the topic um, and when we do that we realize that the idea of, of psychology is actually much more broader um, and much more uh, representative of uh, the, the, the Islamic understanding of what it actually means to be human, um, what it actually means to practice psychology um, and what it actually means to engage as a psychologist. Um, another thing, the third one, is that uh, it's probably important to underline that need does not equate to pragmatism in the sense of Pascal's wager. So um, when we speak about the human need for God, it's not, you know, it's we shouldn't purely look at it from it's it's the best option. We should look at it as though it's the true option. It's the correct uh, thought process. It's the, it's the correct way. Um, and it's, it's and ultimately it's it's a need. Uh, that sits on itself. It's a need because um, because of the preceding uh, premises, which I will, will come to, inshallah. So it's not, you know, um, I need to believe in a God because when, when I pray, I feel good. I need to uh, believe in a God because uh, when I give charity, you know, it, it contributes to society. There has to be a greater um, justification there that transcends, I guess, the individual need. So it shouldn't be that I believe in God because it benefits me, but I believe in God because God is ultimately the one that is worthy of belief and of worship. And just as an aside, that is probably one thing that uh, uh, distinguishes Islamic spirituality um, from other forms of modern day spiritual practices, modern day new age movements. And that is that we ultimately uh, engage in the spiritual practices not to better the, the self, not to feel better, not to unleash the true capacity of oneself, but because Allah Azza wa Jal is ultimately the one that is worthy of being worshipped. So our spiritual journey to God is because God is worthy of it, not because we want uh, to feel better on a personal level. Although the argument is that that is a... Uh, a, a consequence of our of our tezkia, of our juhud, of our spiritual struggle. Uh, and finally, uh, the most important one is the audacious task at hand. Uh, this topic is quite a broad topic. It's not one that I will do justice to. I, I will say that uh, clearly from the start. Um, it's one that has many, it's quite multifaceted. Um, I'm not sure how I can uh, speak about the, the, the psychological, the moral and um, the social components uh, in such short time. So uh, as I mentioned to the um, to the organizers and um, to the moderators uh, that I guess the intention behind it would then be 
uh, that we just want to merely initiate the discussion, speak about uh, essential components that relate to each um, uh, each uh, topic, and hopefully use that as a basis to, to move forward in our engagement and uh, our navigation of uh, of our journey to God, inshallah. So without further ado, I will uh, transition to the actual topic. But I've realized that it's almost 7.20 already, so that just makes it more difficult. Okay. Um, okay, let now... I guess uh, when, when one idea that uh, sort of is at the forefront of this idea of an internal or an innate feeling or an innate disposition to God is the concept of fitra. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Holy Quran, Allah uh, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created people uh, in this state of being or with this state of being. Uh, uh, that is attributed to Allah, fitrat Allah. So there is a divine connection uh, in that natural disposition. I will elaborate a bit more on that. Um, but also a hadith that we we probably all heard of um, growing up, um, especially in Western societies with actual Jews and Christians um, uh, around us. It probably makes more sense to someone who lives in a predominantly Muslim country and does not is not really exposed to, you know. Um, alternative uh, beliefs in God, alternative theologies and, and practices and, and so forth. So the Prophet Sallallahu says, no child is born except on Al-Fitra. And then his parents make him Jewish, Christian, uh, Christian or, or Magian, as an animal produces a perfect young animal. Do you see any part of its body amputated? Um, I want to just focus on the first part of this of this hadith, and that is what the Prophet Sallallahu says, that كُلُّ مَوْلُودٍ يُولَدُ عَلَى الْفِطْرَةِ That every single being that comes into existence is born in a state of a natural inclination towards monotheism, a natural inclination towards a belief in God. And then his parents convert him, or through uh, parent pressure or guidance or uh, teachings and so forth a child shifts away from their uh, internal disposition now let's put this hadith into context okay so there's two two important things to consider when we, when we talk about this hadith first of all what is inclined by uh, al-fitra is not that automatically automatically if you leave this person alone that he will automatically assume all the theological uh, principles of Islam and just on his own automatically without external influence pray, give zakat, give hajj uh, that, uh, so what, what, what filter uh, should be understood here uh, and it will, be, it will be elaborated on is this natural feeling inside of us that we, we need to feel we need to believe in a higher transcendent power i.e. God and ilah the second thing to consider, as the, the scholars of hadith say, is that this should not be limited to Abawain. This should not be limited to parents in terms of the external influences that shift a person away from this state of uh, purity. It can also include their social, um, the social, uh, the different views, different paradigms, dominant paradigms. It can include modern day populism into this, different uh, world views. Um, different ideologies that are dominant, uh, the views of the status quo and so forth. So it should be limited to his parents, but also, I guess, the, the governing ethical ideas that the child is brought up in. And I think when we limit it to that, um, it may begin to make more sense of how it is that a person uh, can transition into something that has an innate desire to want to believe in uh, a greater power, uh, in ultimately in Allah uh, to, um, I guess, disbelieving, not only disbelieving, but uh, as Allah says, ilahahu hawa. Have you not seen the one that has taken his own desire as ilah? So ultimately from this uh, internal disposition into believing, wanting to believe in something greater, to taking the self as thy Lord. And that is important. How does that shift happen? So 
magnanimously, and that is because the fitra becomes tarnished, and we will touch upon that show. As fitra then is the in naturally inclination towards the recognition of God and a moral driven life. And I think the second part to this is very important, is that children have this innate desire to want to do good. They're able to discern at stages. And as the research suggests as well in, in childhood psychology, uh, that children from the earliest ages, uh, stages of development, child development, exhibit an inclination towards good or evil, towards justice, kindness, and empathy for others. Now, it's important to, I guess, uh, clarify that this does not mean that a child, um, you know, um, can't bully from a very young age or, you know, inflict pain on others. Um, I guess uh, to, to, to look at it from a, uh, a child psychology perspective, it's important to differentiate between nature with a capital N and nature with a small N. Children uh, can sometimes do actions uh, that are part of their nature, but, uh, but may be immoral from a, not from a Sharia perspective, but from a cultural perspective and so forth. Uh, and well, one thing that I've uh, realized, I guess, um, building up on that, that idea is that uh, with my own son, actually, uh, bring it to, to topic number three, uh, a toddler's inquisition. My son's just turned, well, he's almost gone to his two and a half, I think, to an um, 2.8, I should say, turning three in a few months. Um, he's, he's just obviously started forming questions, uh, for, started forming sentences, um, and he's also forming questions. And the first questions that he asks, are, it's, you'd think that he's a philosopher, an existential, existential philosopher asking very deep, profound questions. You know, where have I come from? Where am I going? Who am I? What am I? And uh, these are actually very difficult questions to, to, to answer. Um, even for those of you who probably study philosophy, <laughs> you know, philosophers have been grappling with these questions for, 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 for centuries. Um, and obviously as Muslims, we, ha we have an answer, um, but it's, I found it interesting that, you know, someone who still doesn't understand what they're saying uh, properly asks questions that have immense ramifications on how they will govern their, their life moving forward. Um, and so the idea of the fitra then is thus compromised of a conceptual apparatus with ethical, spiritual, and intellectual processing functions by which the external reality is rendered meaningful and life's journey towards Allah or God is appropriately conceived. So this futra is not simply an inward feeling that we have or a, a sort of internal mechanism, but it's something internal that predates the mithaq, that appropriates to man the conceptual tools to be able to navigate life on a spiritual intellectual and moral level now the reality is this then why is it that this is not the case why why do humans sin why do humans disbelieve in god um, why do many muslims uh, after coming to a certain age question god and it comes to back to the topic of the nourishing or the cultivation or the preservation of the fitr as the prophet sallallahu alaihi says it is the responsibility of the parents it is the responsibility of the family it is the responsibility of the community and ultimately of the school to preserve this child's inner fitra and how does that happen what's the most effective way to preserve the fitra simply to abide by the fara'id simply to obey allah's obligations they're there to preserve who we are. And they're ultimately there to teach us and remind us what it ultimately means to be a human being. That's probably the best, uh, I shouldn't say the best, but a, a quick summary of what, of what the purpose uh, of, of, of following the Prophet says, or, or one purpose is to remind us of, of who and what we are and what it means to be human, a human being. Uh, because modern, uh, a lot of the mo modern discussions that take place, and if you ask me, um, even looking at colonialism and its influence on Muslim societies, I think one of the greatest uh, calamities that, that have uh, impacted Muslim societies is that 
there is a reconception or a redefinition of what it actually means to be a human being, what it means to be, be a human being, what it means to exist as a human being. And I think once you distort what it means to be human, then it's, it only follows through that different worldviews and different ideas and different conceptions can influence that same human being. So the futra is there to preserve our existence ontologically in this world. Okay, the God gene, some of you may have heard of this idea. I'm not going to delve on this idea, but I'm going to speak about it um, in a different sense. So obviously neurologists and um, biologists and so forth are, are quite interested in, in the idea of, of a God gene in a sense, is there something internally in our physical construct that encourages us or, or leads us to God? Um, that's not what this topic is about, but it's about the spiritual gene. Is there a spiritual gene in us that ultimately leads us to God? And I guess the answer from a Muslim perspective is yes, there is. And that is the fitrah. And that is why my brothers and sisters, anybody who has an active concern for their spiritual well-being realizes that when they drift apart, when they fall into an error, when they commit a sin or when they neglect an action that has been commanded by God, we feel this sense, or we should at least feel this sense of internal resentment, internal uh, remorse, internal regret, internal unease. In, what the words that I've used are just my uh, the, the endeavor of language to define what, what this is. But ultimately, this is that connection with God that is calling us back to him. And so when we neglect those commands that are there to define us and to connect us to God, we should feel that internal mechanism. And if we're not, our futra has to be reassessed. It has to be cultivated. And ultimately, the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad is there to preserve that and to improve on that, inshallah. Um, from a, I guess, uh, and this is where it can get a bit more uh, theoretical and perhaps probably a bit more uh, contentious, but I just want to put this in there um, from an Ibn Taymiyyah point of view. Ibn Taymiyyah uh, has an interesting argument. I can't say I agree or disagree with this argument because I haven't read and understood it in its entirety, but I will just summarize it and it may be good. It's called, um, well, we can call it the argument from Fitra. According to Ibn Taymiyyah and uh, Ibn, Ibn Qayyim, his student and other uh, uh, scholars, um, all the arguments for the existence of God, the ontological argument, the teleological argument, the kalam cosmological argument, argument from beauty, argument from nature, the moral argument, all of these in the in the eyes of Ibn Taymiyyah are considered nullified and considered unacceptable and the reason for that uh, to sum up is because through something that holds a lesser epistemic value we're trying to validate and verify something that has a greater epistemic value and that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's existence um, now whether uh, one agrees with that or not is, is a different topic but I find it interesting that the argument that he posits in its place, in, pl in, uh, in the place of the ontological argument, the teleological argument, and, and so forth, is actually the argument from Fitra, what, what we've sort of been touching on. And for him, this is all based on the Quranic paradigm, the Quranic epistemology um, of the notion of Fitra. A person's faith is fully justified and meaningfully grounded he argues, without need for logical deductive deductive argumentation. Um, and if you're interested in, in this in this particular argument, um, there are uh, I shouldn't say some, but there's it's becoming more common now for Western uh, Muslims in Western academia uh, to delve uh, or to research uh, more deeply Ibn Taymiyyah's argument of, of the concept of the fitra. Um, just a quick Google search will uh, bring it across some articles. Um, feel free to, 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 to research into that. Um, so he, he further 
argues, and this is taken from an article which I should have mentioned, it is instead justified because it is the only meaningful outlook that emerges naturally from a person's innate disposition, just like belief in the existence of good and evil, causality, numbers, truth, existence, and so on. So it's a prior right. It, so it, it is Allah exists because Allah exists. We can't say in simple terms that Allah exists X plus Y, therefore God exists. Or you can't put God into a syllogism. Your premise A cannot be um, everything has a cause. Um, uh, everything has an effect. Everything, every effect has a cause. Therefore, there must be the initial cause. This, according to Ibn Taymiyyah, um, cannot validate the God's existence. Um, as I said, this is not an argument that I'm positing, um, but it might be good uh, just to be aware uh, that there are there is a minority approach within Islamic intellectual history um, that basically um, uh, uh, postulates a, a different alternative to logical deductive argumentation. Um, and for Ibn Taymiyyah, it's, it's the, the idea of the fitra that the meaning that we acquire as human beings from our worship in God, from our submission, uh, from our orientation towards a God-driven life is, is proof in and of itself. And I haven't done, done justice to the argument, as I've mentioned, um, but it may. It, I, I just wanted to um, share uh, that with you. I'm just going to have a look at the time. Okay. So that, that was uh, the first component. Um, Now, the second is, is from moral necessity. Now, this argument, or at least this, this topic, I find to be um, quite interesting because of my personal uh, experience. One of the things that, I guess, strengthened my belief in, 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 in Islamic scholarship was actually the study of moral philosophy. Um, and it's not that moral philosophy um, was able to prove the questions that I had on Islam um, or substantiate uh, some of my uh, beliefs, but it's that moral philosophy was able, or the study of moral philosophy um, was able to, I guess, destabilize other worldviews uh, that can tend to have truth. So every, every uh, worldview that is espoused by modern um, uh, within any discipline has certain premises and certain assumptions um, that lead to ultimately what they deem to be true. Um, it's important that we engage and interrogate these assumptions before we actually engage in the topic that is being discussed. So, for example, the topic of um, um, let's say uh, 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 let's say the philosophy of science, uh, empirical, uh, the idea of evidence, the idea of proof, uh, the idea of um, uh, of any form of theory that is produced in, in, in modern disciplines. All of these have their own assumptions. Um, and without being aware of those assumptions, to engage in those discussions, I think, um, will only bear um detrimental fruits um so why is this important because when it comes to the idea of good and evil or having a moral compass you need a strong moral ground the epistemic basis in which you stand upon must be strong consistent and coherent and even today must be uh, rational it should be uh, one should be able to uh rationalize uh, the thought process um so from this uh, and much much can be said of this but i guess the idea that that i'm trying to convey here is that as muslims we also have our, our own role compass our own mor morality um we should be able to articulate and express why it is that we believe in what we believe through an understanding of the knowledge uh, tools that are used to come to that actual conclusion rather than working backwards. 
so as Muslims, we rest upon the Quran and Sunnah. Uh, this is the basis for our moral compass. So good and evil can be, can good and evil be determined through reason or through revelation? And both is not, not the topic uh, that I want to delve upon because I would probably won't be able to exit that. Um, but I think it's important to know that everything as Muslims that we accept and disagree with must be grounded in some form of morality. And the epistemic basis of that morality must be sound and consistent. But it's not only that what you are believing is true, but also it should follow through that it has internal, inward, and outward benefits on you. And that is why there has to be a correlation between morality and spirituality. Is that when you live a moral, God-driven life, ultimately there should be a spiritual benefit on you from a Muslim perspective, okay? <laughs> this is common in other uh, disciplines, other traditions as well. But as Muslims, our one should not be based, it should not follow through that because I'm having this spiritual journey, therefore it must be true. Our one is true is that because of the consistency of my morality, that this must reap spiritual benefits. And that is why the idea of Tezkiah, the idea of, um, of a spiritual struggle, or what <coughs> classical scientists call the, the science of Tasawwuf, uh, for example, um, these are all an experiential way of engaging with the theory and seeing that the theory leads to the experience. In, uh, in, in, I guess, more simple ways. It should begin with knowledge, ilm. That ilm should translate into hal, which is a state of that knowledge. And that hal should translate into amal, into action. What should that action change into? Dhulq, spiritual taste. We should feel, <coughs> for example, Prayer, you know to pray, you stand up and pray, but sometimes you stand up and you pray, excuse me, and you realize that I've just literally moved my limbs, I've just prostrated, but I, I haven't actually felt anything inwardly. That's because the dog isn't there, the taste isn't there. Why? Because there's a shortcoming in our engagement with the physical, there's a shortcoming in our engagement with the spiritual realm. If all of those are in sync, that spiritual taste uh, comes about. And this level, this should continue in the form of a taraqi. There should be a spiritual ascension that constantly takes place. And that is why the prayer was called Mi'raj al-Mu'min. The ascension of, of, uh, of the believer. But coming back to the topic, it's important that <clears throat> our grounds for belief in a God should follow through that there is a consistency in our morality and that the strong i can tell you that for us to say that i um i donate um i, I don't eat pork for example because god says so is is a much stronger argument than somebody trying to justify the opposite or to say that for example that you know i, I don't think uh, pork is uh is moral to eat because of X, Y, Z. <clears throat> because the premise for us, it proceeds with God's existence, first proving that God exists. So as you probably saw in episode one and episode two, <coughs> after you've established God's existence, it then follows through that God has interacts with human beings. Then prophet, the belief in prophethood comes about very shortly. Then through the belief in prophethood, these prophets obviously send the message. These messages are codified, formulated into what we call a religion or, or a deen. And ultimately, when you compare Islam with the other religions, um, based on the sound understanding of monotheism, uh, we come to the moral teachings of Islam. And that is why that is important that there is that epistemic basis or strong epistemic basis uh, for for gov that governs our morality. Otherwise, we have what we have today. 
<coughs> a, a relativistic understanding of what should be good and what shouldn't be good. One that is guided by what we said at the start, the human whim or the economy or capitalism or the human or desire to want to ex exploit itself and uh, those around it and the less uh, powerful. <coughs> Afwan. And I think my final slide is the social need. Now, I'm not sure of how uh, the, the organizers requested for the moral, the, the, the social and um, the psychological to be tackled, but um, I've put together something that I think uh, may be of benefit. Now, the social need, <clears throat> I think when you think of God uh, in the concept of his relationship with society. It's important to come back to the basic understanding of Tawheed. <clears throat> now I want to put it, I want to underscore that Tawheed should not be minimized to just a mere belief in one God. Tawheed is much greater than a belief in one God. Just looking at the Arabic uh, root words of Tawheed, the word Wahada reminds us that it's a recurrent practice, that there's a constant unification that is taking place in our engagement with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And as a result, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's relationship with the material and immaterial realm. So this idea, it's important that we do have this sound connection with God because then we have unity, harmony, and uh, and uh, unification in all of our engagement with the physical and the metaphysical realm in societies, uh, in our engagement with knowledge, in our engagement with uh, people of different orientations, uh, in our engagement with alam and ghaib, in our engagement with uh, the realm of the unseen. And when this happens, we have true balance. And this is the argument, basically. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inni ja'inun fil ardi khalifa, that on earth I established a vicegerent, a khalifa. And the purpose of that vicegerent is to <coughs> practice and establish God's sharia. Ah. And from that, from that, uh, which is basically uh, centered on the idea of tawheed, there should be balance on the earth. Now, I want to just share with you a book that I'm uh, currently reading. Uh, by Ahmed Paul Killer. The book is titled Rethinking Islam and the West. And basically in this book, he interrogates the modern idea of what progress actually means. I mean, if his argument is that there is quite a reductive idea of progress that is limited to scientific progress, technological advancement, <coughs> and economic growth. And his argument is that this is actually not progress because what we're seeing is that it is actually harming society. It is harming climate change. It is leading to the, the destruction of the environment. So he calls for an alternative, one based on the Quranic concept of Mizan, which means balance. <clears throat> in Surah Ar-Rahman, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about the Mizan in the, in the first page. And he articulates it as the spiritual, social, and material balance. So it's not only progress in one realm, but progress in multiple realms. <clears throat> and the argument is that when there is <clears throat> equal emphasis given on the spiritual, social, and material, that is when we will have ultimate balance. But this can only be true when it's grounded in the idea of Tawheed. Because the spiritual is ultimately guided by Allah Sharia. The social is guided by Allah Sharia. And the material is guided by Allah Sharia. So ultimately this comes back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the consequences, at least the material consequences and the immaterial consequences of believing in that one God is that it brings balance on a cosmological level. And this is where the powerful idea is of, of, of Islam uh, as Ahmed uh, Killer tries to articulate, uh, comes into play. So <clears throat> the social need stems. Society uh, needs God. God does not need society. And when there is that connection with Allah, that's when ultimately society will flourish and thrive. And if you look at 
and he critiques the golden age of Islam as well, the, the, the notion that there was a golden age of Islam, um, because ultimately it's very difficult to determine spiritual <coughs> progress. It might be that, you know, people in the third world war are more spiritually advanced uh, than Muslims living in first world war countries. You know, what, what, what criteria actually determines growth and balance and progress? If we look at it from a spiritual perspective, from a ontological, from a, a, and I guess through the same paradigm, it might be that, you know, somewhere, some country in, in South Asia might be considered a first world country, and the West uh, is a third world country spiritually. What is the basis? Uh, so it's important that we interrogate these criterions that are there to sort of compartmentalize society based on a criteria that Islam doesn't necessarily uh, approve of. Um, so just to sum up, I guess um, <clears throat> from a moral, psychological and uh, social need uh, perspective, we need God in our engagement with the psychology, with society, for our morality and for our own psychological well-being, um, and not vice versa, as um, as I've tried to explain, uh, because ultimately, when that connection there with is with God, we thrive and flourish on an individual, moral, intellectual, uh, and spiritual level. Um, I do want to apologize if my talk has been somewhat incoherent and um, un, uh, I guess not well researched. Um, I would probably like to concede that um, it was quite an, uh, an ambitious task to speak about these three topics uh, in such a uh, in the time that was given. Um, however, the intention was to uh, I guess plant seeds uh, for further thought and for further discussion and inshallah uh, that's the intention if there are any questions um, it might be an apt time to to pose them um, but I would like to thank you for listening and being patient with me and I'd like to pass the microphone back to sister Radia inshallah and jazakallah khair jazakallah khairan ustad that was not incoherent at all. Um, this is a very difficult topic, as you've mentioned. And um, honestly, the, the things that you were mentioning were truly fascinating. Um, you know, I think particularly going into the meetings down to the root words of, of, of fitra and tawheed was really beneficial. Um, you know, it's very easy for us to kind of throw these words around and mm. not fully understand them. So I, for one, really appreciated that explanation mm. and, you know, how it relates to Islam generally as, as that perfect innate way of life. Um, and I loved that you described fitra um, in one instance as a personal connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I've, I've never thought of it like that. And I think that that was, that was really beautiful. Um, so anyway, to continue this excellent discussion, we are going to move on to the questions that have come through from the audience. And it's safe to say that there are some very interesting ones in here. Mm -hmm. So the first asks, um, how do you explain fitra in adamant disbelievers? Why are some people so deviated from their inner fitra? Okay. Um... I guess it might be more, uh, just to simplify the question, why do people turn away from Islam? Maybe um, assuming that <coughs> futra uh, correlates to or should lead to Islam, why do people uh, turn away from Islam? And I think the, the, the answer is multifaceted. Um, there are a lot of reasons. So a turn away from Islam is strongly connected to a turn away or the uh, or the tarnishing of the fitra. The whole purpose of the teachings of Islam is there to preserve the fitra. So when a person is praying, his akhlaq or she, her akhlaq uh, is intact, her connection with society um, and uh, is in, 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 in adherence with uh, how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, I guess desires for, for our interactions to be. It is safe to argue that there is a strong uh, 
there is a strong connection between that person's actions and their futra being intact. I think when you look at modern disbelief um, or modern, uh, to, to, I guess, modern manifestations on, to, on turning away from God um, and from Islam ultimately, uh, I wouldn't say it's because of obviously Islam per se or of God's existence per se, but because of the expressions of, of Muslims or the way the expressions of Islam as articulated by uh, scholars or people's, per, uh, uh, people's personal journeys and their experiences uh, that are subjective um, and sometimes cloud them from a clear engagement with, with Islam. Uh, and with the filter. So it begins, look, this is very important, and I'd like to emphasize this point. The preservation of the filter does not actually begin in school. The school, and when I mean school, I mean, um, you know, uh, kindergarten or prep. The first institution which uh, cultivates the filter or tarnishes the filter is the institution of the family. And I think it's important that we see the family institution as a actual, as a schooling educational institution. Because what happens is then parents get lax and they say teaching starts at five, teaching starts at six. And then the child comes to the age of six, his, his foot is already, his, his character is already developed to an extent. And what happens, they put them in a public school, they put them in an in inadequate Islamic school, or, or it might be that they're in a, in a good environment as well. But the foundations have already been set. So I think that if from day one you can perceive that, yes, this, the baby is born and it's already in an, in an educational institution. And I, as the mother, the, 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 the brother, the father, am, am the first teacher, I feel like we, we will probably um, bear great, greater fruits and greater results. But what happens is that parents disconnect themselves from the, the, the notion of tarbiya, from, from the idea of them being the first murabbi being the first uh, educator of the child. So it's, 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 it's a long journey, and it may be that the person's futra can return to its original state, and that's why the concept of istighfar, tawbah, is there, because it's, it's, it's not there to remind us that we must be perfect. It's there to remind us that when we do fall, when we sort of you know, drift away, when we fall into those sins that you know, we, we would hope that we do not, that... Allah's already given us the tools to, to take ourselves out of that. And the purpose is, is to use them rather than to preserve, try and preserve that purity. Um, but it's to remind ourselves that when we do fall, uh, that alhamdulillah, you know, God's maghfira uh, and his rahmah is, is there to save me up. So I'm not sure if that sort of answered the question. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, I think I think that yeah. explained it really, really well. Um, yeah. I kind of like how I'm, I'm picturing it in my mind is that, you know, that fitra is it's there but it needs to be nurtured you know if it's if it's forgotten if it's left left abandoned of course it's not going to you know flourish into um a practicing muslim of course it needs to be nurtured by their environment and as you said the home as that first point of um yeah of um teaching absolutely um and i guess yeah that comes to our second question that kind of says um, believing in and obeying God is really exhausting. And so they ask, why can't belief just be the inner and not have to be practiced physically? For example, praying. This is a very good question. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I think it's good that this question was asked because this was ultimately um, something that was uh, prevalent, I, I wouldn't say widely, but existed during the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the Quran even speaks about this in, in multiple places. Uh, for example, you know, the Bedouins or the Arab um, uh, desert people say that we believe, say to them, no, you don't believe, um, you've just submitted. So here we understand that there is a distinction ultimately between uh, Iman and Islam. Islam being uh, the acceptance, the theoretical acceptance that something is true, uh, whereas Iman is the experiential submission. That, okay, not only is this true, but I'm going to actually practice it as well in my day-to-day -day life. So I think to ultimately see the fruits of, uh, Iman, uh, of Islam, there has to be a strong correlation between the belief 
Because ultimately you believe in Islam. This is what it comes down to because God tells you to believe, to believe in Islam, to, to believe in Islam and the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But if you accept that premise, then it should follow through that then you should also submit to what Allah Azza wa Jalla is telling you. Now, but the, ultimately the question comes down to this. Why do we perceive the ibadat to be exhausting uh, and challenging? And the reality is that they are. Let's, it's, it's very rare that, you know, you, you find a young person so energized uh, to, to want to get up to prayer. You know, we shouldn't be too hard on everybody who experiences this because this is, this is, this is a state of what it means to be a believer. You know, one, one, one Sahaba comes to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Imam Bukhari Sahih narrates this and he says, Ya Rasulullah, لَقَدْ كَثْرَ عَلَيَّ شَرَعِيَ الْإِسْلَامِ He literally says that the sharia or the, the, the rulings or the path, um, I've, I, I literally find, I find it very difficult. Like too many rulings. Tell me something that I can do that is easy for me and I can be consistent. Now listen to this, okay? A sahaba is coming to the Prophet and saying, yes, look, I accept what you're saying, but I just find it difficult. Tell me something that I can do that's going to simplify this process and I'm going to actually commit to it. It's a similar question, I guess, in one, in one uh, aspect. And the Prophet Sallallahu says, make sure that your tongue is moist with the zikr of Allah. Now, this, is, this requires contemplation and delving. Why did the Prophet Sallallahu not say pray, for example? Why did he not say go and do your hajj? Or you know, wake up for the hajj, make dua to Allah that he that he takes you out of this state. But he told him to simply just keep God on the tip of your tongue consistently. And I find that powerful. And upon contemplation and and on reading the 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 the, the thing of the ulama, I guess w- one way to 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 resemble it that that would make sense to us is I resemble the the concept of. Um, keeping the, the tongue moist to the, the function of oil in the motor. Now, a motor can be um, as well designed as it, as it can be. Yeah. Let's just say Porsche designed or Mercedes designed motor. You can have a very good engine. The tires can be very good. But what happens when there's no oil? Will that motor function? It will die out. So the purpose of the zikr is there to initiate that internal journey to god it's not the end journey that's where it starts and what we realize is through these spiritual words these spiritual words have an impact on our physiology on our physical being so the prophet is basically saying start there and you will see with consistency and perseverance that you will have strength to do those prayers to do the hajj zakat and so forth Mm -hmm. that's when people come to me and say i want to start praying my advice is start with one prayer and just pray the fard and do it quick. Because what's going to happen? He's, he's 25 years old. He's missed 10 years of qada. Oh, brother, you got to pray your fard. Make, you prayed sunnah as well. And pray your qada as well. Like, what's going to happen? <laughs> yeah. He's thinking, so I got to pray. For, not only do I have to pray five times a day. Not only do I have to add the nawafin onto that. But I also have to pray 10 years. Um, and this literally just happened today as well. One brother saying that I'm not really consistent in my prayers because when I was young, they told me that, you know, since you hit puberty, you have to do your qada of all the prayers that you missed. He's like, what's the point of me praying one today when I've got 10,000 in history? Um, but ultimately, it's it's not about that as well. It's not about ticking all the boxes. It's it's the intentions. You can intend that, Ya Allah, I start today. Um, I want to pray my qada gradually um, and so forth. And Allah might accept your intention. Because ultimately, it's not the, the actions that will be weighed, um, but, the, but the intention that was behind that action. Um, so, sister, to, uh, or uh, sorry, to, to the questioner, there has to be a correlation between belief and action if we want to ultimately benefit. Because what, what difference does it make if I believe in a God, I accept his majesty, I accept his mercy, but I don't want to benefit from the fruits of that mercy, of that compassion, by engaging in that practice. Um, and I think uh, if if there's anything that um, can allow us to uh, taste the beauty of this religion, 
it is through those spiritual practices and it begins with zikr as well mm. um as as a stepping stone for someone who's ch who's challenged in his or her uh ob in fulfilling the obligations i, I would uh, suggest you know la ilaha illallah and salawat are two of the most powerful mm. zikrs that we can say if you can be consistent with your la ilaha illallah and your allah masalli ala muhammad you will see and this is what our scholars say, is that those spiritual words will have an impact on the, on the cosmos because Allah is ultimately behind that. And he will, he will transform miracles uh, for us that we can see and things that we can't see, inshallah. So there, there's two remedies that the, the ulama uh, mentioned. Um, it would be good to, to, to make that a, a daily practice. Mm, as absolutely. A stepping stone. Yeah, and I think, you know, as, as you were speaking, I was I was also thinking of, you know, you mentioned that, that the stepping stone of, of dhikr as a starting point. And, you know, when you're when you're constantly um, in remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you you also start thinking about why you believe. And mm. I think, you know, it's it's important for us to first educate ourselves to understand what our religion is and you know, truly um, find that love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and for the religion and the yeah. actions will just come so much easy, yeah. easier yeah. after that. Yeah. Um, you know, for a lot of us who, alhamdulillah, were born Muslim, it's if we don't actually go seeking knowledge, it kind of just feels like an everyday task that you have to do. So um, I think absolutely starting with dhikr and, you know, reestablishing that that faith, that uh, conviction and and that love yeah. for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make it so much easier as well. Yeah. Uh, and just to add, obviously the best zikr is, is the Qur'an, um, but, but obviously not everybody knows how to read the Qur'an, and you know we all know the, the shahad, inshallah, and, and salawat, so um, they can all complement each other. Inshallah. Jazakallah yeah. khairan. Um, I think I am aware of the time, but we've had so many incredible questions come through. I think I'll just go through one more. Yeah, maybe and... maybe if you if if you like, just um, you can probably read all of them, yeah. and I can try and uh, incorporate them into one answer. <laughs> yeah, that would that would be great. That would work really well. Okay, um, so no we've promises. got uh, how do we explain fitra to non-Muslims, um, and how would you guide a a non-believer who is over the age of 60 to Islam or the existence of God because the older people get the more difficult it is to, um, you know, yeah. spread dawah. I think, yeah, those two you can um, join, I think. <clears throat> okay. I think this is just a general principle. Any form of engagement with, uh, with a non-Muslim um, requires first the establishment of the parameters of that discussion i think uh, it's important to establish in the mind of the uh, of, of of the non-muslim how muslims think how muslims analyze the world how they yeah. how they analyze reality the concept of the physical the metaphysical realm and the realm of allah azza wa jal. and when you can't do that it's always a challenge one example would be that any, more, any student that's gone through the modern neoliberal education system who comes across the, the Quranic, uh, the hadith that says on the day of judgment, uh, the Prophet says on the day of judgment, the sun will be brought um, within the, the, the span of, I think, one mile or one kilometer. I can't remember the exact uh, specific number. Any modern mind that reads that will argue that that, that is impossible. The reality is that, yes, it is impossible empirically. When there isn't a distinction between something that is empirically possible and rationally impossible, these lines get diluted and it's very difficult. It's important that we're, we can distinguish between something being rationally possible because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said so within his realm, within his power, and it being scientifically and empirically impossible. If we put on the lens of, 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 uh, of an Islamic worldview, it becomes easier to analyze such contentious topics and i think to in, to speak to non-muslims it's important to first take a step back because they come there with their assumptions you come with your uh, assumptions um but ultimately explain to them how it is that i as a believer analyze worldview what is my epistemology what what does truth mean to me how do i acquire truth 
Revelation is an important uh, uh, tool. Uh, reason is an important tool. Sense perception is an uh, important tool. And also spiritual uh, intuition is also an, an important tool. Uh, I think th these require time. I'm speaking uh, in terms of principle. But there's also this element of Islam as well. And this comes ties into the second question. <clears throat> One of the most, I think, uh, uh, I, when I was in studying in Cambridge, uh, the, the, the Cambridge University Muslim students, the, it's called an ISOC there, they approached a Muslim academic at, um, he, was at the, he was at the university, Professor Tim Winter, some of you may have heard of him. And they, he's a Muslim. They said to him, Sheikh, you know, um, what advice would you give uh, to us um, in engaging with uh, the students here and trying to draw their hearts to Islam? Because they're very rational. They, they ask too many questions. <laughs> the discussions are always dialectical. There's always uh, argumentation. H how do we engage with these people? Um, because if you're not trained um, in, in theology and, 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 and in, in a bit of philosophy, it's sometimes very difficult to navigate this discussion. And I found that his answer profound. His answer was this. He said, invite them to your ISOC gatherings and show them the brotherhood and sisterhood of Islam. And you will see that they will be drawn to that because ultimately that's what the heart yearns. Being in a community amongst other people who you don't know, look different to you, to come together. I mean, the prayer is powerful. Jama'a is powerful. How is it that I can just randomly come to a mosque, any mosque around the world, touch shoulders with someone I've never met, rub shoulders, and at the end, give that person a hug? <laughs> Someone is a complete stranger to me. What is it that allows us to transcend those boundaries in a world that is so divided, in a world that is so polarized, in a world that is, is created, constructed to push us away from each other? Yeah. I can come and in a matter of a few seconds, in three minutes, give, give a Muslim brother a kiss on the cheek and say, Salaam Alaikum. <laughs> There's something uh, powerful there that words can't describe. And people are drawn to that, especially the elderly. Because as people get older, are older, they experience more forms of loneliness, especially when, when the family unit is broken, and especially in Western society, where once a child hits 18, he's already separated from his parents. And so at that age, I think it's important to show the social uh, elements of Islam rather than trying to intellectually um, debate, debate these people. Mm. Um, and I'll give you one example. I was in Oxford last year. One of uh, the sisters... Uh, who, I was on the same level with. She, she, she made a sort of confession. It was very sad when I heard this, um, but, but, but I think there was a deep yearning there. She said that she, I think she's an atheist. Um, she said that on Christmas, my mum and I, what we do is we go from church to church and just mix amongst the crowds um, because we miss that sort of social gathering. Uh, that 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 sense of purpose, yeah. and she's 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 not a Christian, um, she's wow. an atheist. She studies at Oxford. She's mm. I don't know. She's probably got a, a career set set up, but there's that there's that emptiness there that she that she yearns for, yeah. and I think that we shouldn't underestimate the, the the power of inviting someone just to our gatherings and letting them just experience what you and I see as see as normal. Yeah. But for them, it, it, it may be transformative. And I'm sure we've all had that experience with you know, people that we may know that have come to our gatherings. Um, mm. Yeah, that's that's I hope that somewhat answers. Uh, no, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. I think, you know, that the community that we have as as Muslims is something that you can't see with any yeah. other group of people, you know, like our community transcends like language and culture and countries and you know, it's, I was even thinking as you were speaking about um, going to a mosque and, you know, brushing shoulders with a stranger, I was thinking mm -hmm. even the salam, you know, you can, people see me in a hijab, they know I'm a Muslim mm -hmm. and they will greet me. I've never met this person before, yeah. but we all automatically have that connection, you know, yeah. and that's something that you won't see. It's difficult to like walk past someone and say hello, you know, yeah. but having something yeah. that just connects every Muslim, regardless of, of language or culture or where you are in the world, it's, yeah. it's a beautiful thing. Yeah. And for us, alhamdulillah, because it's, uh, it seems it's normative. We sometimes 
underappreciated yeah. but it's it's good to remind ourselves that, that that is powerful and a lot of people yearn for that and are deprived from it and just just mm. in in the uk i think a couple of years ago a ministry for loneliness was established to cater for you know the elderly that are now alone just waiting on yeah. waiting for death with nobody around them so, um, we're so lucky alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. um with that i think we will leave it there we are over time <laughs> um, Jazakallah khair. Jazakallah khair. And, um just really quickly unfortunately we don't have time to go through all of the questions of course um i do apologize to anyone listening if we couldn't get to your question um we had so many interesting ones come through but please feel free to ask any further questions through the basira forum website and there'll be a link in the chat for you soon um Ustad, Talha, Jazakallahu Khairan for your time today and for sharing with us your wisdom and your knowledge. It has truly been an honor to learn from you today. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on behalf of the team at Basira Forum to protect and preserve you mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. to reward you infinitely for all the work that you are doing in the Muslim Inshallah. community. Jazakallahu Khair, sister, and thank yeah. you and the Basira team.